What do arguments look like as they unfold? We're used to seeing them in real time, on the street, on Twitter, between politicians. But what about a past polemic, a historical quarrel? That's harder to recover. We forget things. Who said what and when? But could we get this lost history back? Could we reconstruct the punches of one of those great era-defining debates? Well, how would you do that, and why would you bother? Let's take an example. A quarrel that rocked 18th century France, but which is rarely remembered today. This was the quarrel about how to reform literary teaching in the prestigious public boys' schools known as the Courage. This polemic began in 1762 with the expulsion of the Jesuits. The Jesuits were a famous Catholic teaching order. By the early 1760s, they ran a third of all of France's collège, like this one, the Collège de la Flèche. Within a few months, the Jesuit expulsion left tens of thousands of boys without teachers. This was a crisis. With the Jesuits discredited, their renowned Latin literary curriculum also came under scrutiny. Now I'm going to put the Jesuits to one side for a second. Because that same year, 1762, another high-profile event rocked the sphere of education. The publication of Rousseau's novel comme treatise Émile, about the innovative, private education of an imagined young boy who's raised with little knowledge of organised religion, books or even other children. This controversial work stoked yet more interest in education, in whether and how it might need shaking up. And so, a quarrel was born. A quarrel about how to reform those laughable collèges, as Rousseau called them. About what books and authors France's future great men should read, what languages they should know, and what literary skills they should have. And a quarrel about what a French literary classic, not a Latin one, might be. I've called this debate the Querelle des Collèges. By the revolution, it consisted of over 200 published texts by more than 120 actors, from philosophes to small-town teachers, journalists to parents to politicians. But I don't just want to tell you about it. I want to show you it. Here it is as a bibliography of texts. But this is useless if you haven't read them. You don't know what they say or who they attack. OK, here it is again as a graph showing the choral texts published each year. Here you can see a bit more, a peak, for instance, between 62 and 64. But the graph's still not that helpful. You can't get to the texts behind the data points. You don't know who wrote them or what they said. So here's a third way to see the debate, as a network. A network of texts and of people who praise or attack one another, who forge camps of opinion, for the teaching of modern French authors or against altering the Latin curriculum, for traditional teaching methods or against them. This dynamic network visualisation was made by network scholar Marc Sarzin using the NDTV package in the statistical computing programme R and based on a database of the Querelle des Collèges that I created. This database records the references made between one choral text and another and it logs also the quality of that reference, whether it's positive, negative, ambivalent, neutral, and so on. Each node in this visualisation, each little circle, is a text that took part in the quarrel. Publication dates along the bottom. The nodes or texts appear in roughly chronological order of publication. A blue node is a text by one or several individual writers. Yellow signifies an article published in a periodical and pink is an intervention by an institution, like an academy or a parliament. The arrows you see between texts, the edges or ties, signify a reference made from one text to another. Green for a positive reference, red for negative, amber for ambivalent, grey for neutral, with a few outliers I discuss in my book. A black line denotes a response to what I call a catalyst text. To give you an example of one of these, in 1763, the Toulouse teacher of philosophy, Jean Mavard, won the prize for the Académie des Jeux Floraux de Toulouse's annual essay competition. The question that Academy asked was, what would be the best plan of studies for France? The 
the Academy's question then is one of these catalysts. It doesn't itself fulfil any of the three criteria for inclusion in my corpus of the choral, but it is still part of this debate since it encourages participation, stirring up interest and argument. All right, back to the dynamic network. You can interact with this visualisation on the digital companion site to my book. You can click on a node to see the short name and date of the text, which you can then find in the numbered chronological corpus of the choral in my book and on the digital site. If you click on a tie between texts, you can see the corpus numbers. If you're really keen, you can use the slider in the top right to slow this all down, or if you're bored, you can speed it all up. This dynamic visualisation shows you then, at a glance, when texts were published. You can follow chains of text and response. Some texts had responses almost immediately. For instance, the disgruntled Jansenist teacher, Jean-Baptiste Crevier, quickly took against the Breton jurist, La Chaloté, for his essay on national education. La Chaloté argued, among other things, that boys whose fathers plied manual trades should not be admitted to the collège. Crevier, meanwhile, argued that all boys, regardless of social standing, required a collège education in Latin. If they couldn't understand Latin, they couldn't read the Latin Bible. And for the Jansenist Crevier, if you couldn't read the Bible, you couldn't know God. For him, then, this was essential. Sadly for Crevier, though, opinion ended up being with La Chaloté. Then again, a dynamic visual can also help us see that some responses were much slower to arrive, appearing even when we'd least expect them. In 1753, the philosophe d'Alembert published an important article in the famous Encyclopédie. Entitled Collège, his article attacked what he saw as these schools' outdated literary teaching practices and their focus on Latin and Greek classics. So why is it that some 25 years later, in the 70s and 80s, a flurry of texts start bringing it up again? The visual alone can't answer this, but what it can do is reveal symptoms of the quarrel, flagging what needs investigation, closer reading. It can also help us spot trends. Each year in the debate is allotted the same play duration, so 1763 has the same screen time as 64 and as every other year. This means you can see the peaks and troughs of interest, the years when nodes and ties fly in, and the years where it all goes a bit quiet. You can think of the quarrel as having other sorts of peaks and troughs, for instance in terms of its moments of conflict. There are lots of red and orange arrows, negative and ambivalent references, on this visual, but there are even more green, positive interactions. Now this is quite usual in cultural disputes. For every idea you attack, there'll probably be others with which you agree. This is how camps of opinion form. You might assume that the years with the highest number of red and orange ties mark the quarrel's high points of polemic. Then again, I think the peaks in green ties are worth a closer look. The year that sees the greatest number of these green ties is 1768. So what or who is responsible for this? Let's rewind to that year. Now just watch what happens, because there is our culprit, this big spider of green. So who is this relentlessly positive person? It turns out it's a teacher from the University of Aix named Jean-Alexis Borelli. Never heard of him? Well, you're not alone. Because in 1768, Borelli was also pretty much anonymous. In fact, this seems to have been his first published text. In it, he argues that the government should employ experienced teachers to read the many recent publications on education reform and to distill from them the best solutions. Now, Borelli's no fool. He presents himself as the ideal man for this job. But he's a relatively young teacher and an unknown writer with few connections. So how does he establish his authority? By showing off just how much he's read and by being so unfailingly nice. He praises 19 different choral texts. But we might wonder whether Borelli should really be considered part of this choral. I mean, 
he doesn't look very quarrelsome. Then again, let's remember that intervening in a dispute diplomatically, while parading your own reading, is just another strategy to claim authority, power. Diplomacy, after all, is an important strategy of war. So I don't think Borrelli is as meek as he seems, and I think he teaches us something about the apparently positive references made in this and other debates. He reminds us what sociolinguists have told us for years, that linguistic form is not always equal to communicative function. Put simply, that an apparently kind word can still be a quarrelsome act. Now, as well as representing the Curel des Colleges as a network of texts referring to one another, you could also think of it as a network of people or groups of people, individuals, periodicals or institutions. If you visualise the network like this, in which nodes are people, you spot other things again. Perhaps it's finally time to mention Rousseau and Émile. In the network of texts, Emile is the largest node. You watch it grow as it accumulates references from 64 quarrel texts. But Rousseau, true to form, has a paradoxical place in this quarrel. If you tell the algorithm behind the network visualisation to determine node size according to the number of references a node makes, discounting those it receives, the Rousseau node suddenly shrinks. Because he doesn't make a single reference in the querelle. He intervenes early on, says his piece with Emile, drops the mic and leaves. It's others who drag him back into the room, as we can see with this halo of ties surrounding him. According to out-degree centrality then, the references a node makes, the press are among the most central actors of the quarrel, alongside a member of the Paris Parlement, Roland d'Arceville, and two little-known collège teachers, one of whom is our man Borrelli. Watching this historical quarrel unfold as a network that expands over time allows you to see it in a whole new light, to sense its speed, its busy years and its lulls, to spot strange or forgotten features that need investigation, Rousseau's paradoxical role, the delayed reaction to D'Alembert's article, or Borrelli's sudden, apparently positive, appearance. It allows you to understand the number and variety of actors who participated in this past debate, not just the Rousseaus of this world, but also regional institutions, press titles, long-forgotten teachers, clergy and magistrates. A visualisation can only tell you so much, but as a map to tell you where to dig down into the historical texts, Maybe it could set you on course for buried treasure.